Well, thank you for this opportunity and thank you to all the volunteers. Today, I would like to take this opportunity to speak to you about the ultimate gift, donating your body to science. So although we all have this option today, this hasn't always been the case. So let's go back in time and see uh, the state of things. Basically, around the 19th century and 18th centuries, the only way bodies were used in medical or came to be into medical programs were if they were um, criminals that received capital punishment. Now, executed criminals were the only source, and in the uh, 18th century, uh, many people were being put to death for trivial crimes. Uh, we'll just think about London, England for the moment. However, uh, up until the 19th century, uh, we had better laws being enacted, and the actual number of people that were receiving capital punishment shrunk down to about 50. Now, this was a problem when you consider that during the 19th century, uh, there was a huge boom in medical uh, campuses. So a lot more uh, demand for bodies to be dissected. And in fact, if again we look at London in the 19th century, we find that 500 bodies were needed, but only 50 were being made available. So as a consequence, what happened was a black market developed for procuring uh, bodies and providing them to the medical campuses. Uh, this is the body snatching trend of the uh, early 19th century, and these practices were despicable. Uh, these robbers would go to graveyards, and just hours after families had mourned uh, the loss of a loved one, they would remove the body from the grave. And what this basically meant is that if you went to bury a family member, you would need to stay there days after the ceremony just to make sure the body wasn't tampered with. And actually, this is the point when iron fences were being installed around uh, grave sites. Now, this all changed in 1830 in England when the uh, legislature uh, realized these problems and they enacted a special law that basically now said that the bodies of unclaimed people in the city morgues could now be used as anatomical resources in medical campuses. Uh, and this law was also very important because it now required all anatomical instructors, uh, professors to be licensed. And it also had an interesting side consequence. It actually meant now that um, civilians could actually will their body uh, to be dissected upon the time of their death. And I'll just speak about probably one of the most interesting donated bodies of all time. This body is that of an executed Texas prisoner. He was actually executed August 5th, 1993. His body, upon being put to death through lethal injection, was frozen in a gelatin block, and this block was milled away one millimeter at a time, with each slice being photographed, and then digitized, and then assembled into the virtual cadaver that you see here. And actually, this uh, visible man, as it's called, is used uh, throughout the country, uh, throughout the United States, for educating medical professionals. Now this is, I admit, this is a pretty uh, you know, odd outcome for a donated body, so let me just tell you where most donated bodies end up. Most donated bodies, around 80%, are going to find their way into the cadaver lab at a medical institution. And there's a very good reason for this, and that reason goes back to Business 101. That reason is supply and demand. It just turns out that over the next 10 years, jobs in healthcare sector are going to grow uh, the most rapid of any other sector, and there are predictions that around 4 million jobs will be added over the next 10 years. And the sad fact is that even in current day, there is a challenge to meet the needs of current medical programs. Uh, there's still a bit of deficit there. So now, with more healthcare uh, professionals to be trained, this problem is going to increase at an accelerating rate. Well, you might be asking yourself, how will my body be used to teach healthcare professionals in the cadaver lab? And I'll mention two of the primary ways. The first way is full body dissection. So over the course of several hours, uh, the skin is removed, uh, muscles and tendons reveal themselves, uh, soon followed by blood vessels, nerves, ultimately getting down to the joints and bones. Now the second way is a little bit more long-term. And this requires the collection of internal organs, and preserving these organs in the cadaver lab for semesters to come. So 
such as this human heart. This human heart has been in the cadaver lab for several semesters now, and countless numbers of students have come through, uh, held this heart in their hands, and gained insight into the truth and beauty that is the human heart, its anatomy, and its function. Now, the second time you might have thought about body donation is when you were at uh, the DMV. So maybe uh, you had a thought, does becoming an organ donor mean that I might end up in a cadaver lab someday? And the answer is no. There's a completely separate process for willing your body as an anatomical gift. So in this form that I've filled out a few weeks ago, this is stating that I would like my remains to become an anatomical teaching resource for students in Colorado. And for me, this was a very logical step to make because I've been spending countless hours teaching and learning from donated bodies. So I find that University of California professor Hugh Patterson actually put it best when he said, I've enjoyed teaching anatomy, and look, I get to do it after I die. <laughs> so if the true definition of a gift is giving without expecting anything in return, then I encourage you to consider donating your body as your ultimate gift. Thank you.